got uh, five resolutions, and we'll be taking these up one at a time. Uh, some of these are are required two readings. The, the gas margin increase will require two readings. Today's first reading, correct? And some just one. First, we'll take up is resolution twelve ninety uh, regarding the. Increasing the gas rates. This will be the first of two readings. Is, is there a motion regarding resolution 1290? So moved. Okay. Any discussion? Mr. Coley? Commissioner Anderson? Aye. Commissioner Connell? Second motion is motion is resolution uh, 1291 uh, regarding the uh, requesting city council approval on the bond issues for both gas and water divisions. Um, this will be a uh, first and final on this one. Correct. Any, any motion regarding resolution 1291? Some Second. Any discussion? Mr. Anderson, Aye. Mr. Pinnell, Aye. Mr. Hamilton, Aye. Mr. Herbert, Aye. Mr. Robinson, Aye. Mr. Thompson, Aye. Mr. Williams. Aye. Uh, resolution 1291 has uh, passed unanimously. Okay, then resolution 1292 is uh, requesting authorization for short-term short line of credit on the gas division. Resolution. Discussion? Mr. Cole? Uh, Commissioner Anderson? Aye. Commissioner Connell? Aye. Commissioner Hamilton? Aye. Mr. Herbert? Aye. Mr. Robinson? Aye. Commissioner Thompson? Aye. Commissioner Williams? Aye. Resolution 1292 passed. And that was a first and final reading on that resolution. Next is resolution 1293, uh, requesting approval for the uh, fiscal year 2014 budget appropriation. That's so moved. I have a motion. Second. Any discussion? Mr. Cole. <coughs> Mr. Anderson? Aye. Commissioner Connell? Aye. Commissioner Hamilton? Aye. Mr. Herbert? Aye. Mr. Robinson? Aye. Commissioner Thompson? Aye. Commissioner Williams? Aye. Resolution 1293 passed unanimously. Resolution 1294, requesting approval for fiscal year 2014 commitment appropriation. Second. A motion and a second. Any discussion? Mr. Cole? Commissioner Anderson? Aye. Commissioner Connell? Aye. Commissioner Hamilton? Aye. Commissioner Herbert? Aye. Commissioner Robinson? Aye. Commissioner Thompson? Aye. And Commissioner Williams? Aye. All right, resolution 1294 is passed. Yeah. Okay. I have a quick question after the fact. The bond issues, what's the timing on the two bond issues? Um, I anticipate right now, Commissioner, probably going to council late summer with an early fall sale. Um, we have flexibility in that regard. We can go sooner if, if need be. Um, but, but that's what I'm thinking about right now. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Resolution 1295 <coughs> is a uh, resolution of recognizing uh, the 80th anniversary of EBA. Uh, commissioners, this did not come out to you in the Friday packet because uh, we just became aware of it late last week. Uh, there is going to be a ceremony tomorrow at TBA recognizing them for their 80th anniversary, and I've been asked to come and speak on behalf of KUB. And with uh, Commissioner Anderson and I were talking about it, we thought it might be nice for this board to consider a resolution that I could take and present to the TBA board tomorrow when I'm there. You have the uh, resolution, but I think Bill Coley is prepared to read it aloud if you would prefer that. Did, did everybody have an opportunity to read it? Did anybody feel a strong need for Mr. Coley to read it out loud? If you wanted to read it out loud, raise your hand. Seeing no hands, um, is there a motion regarding? Resolution 1295. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Mr. Cohen? Commissioner.
Commissioner Anderson. Aye. Commissioner Connell. Aye. Commissioner Hamilton. Aye. Commissioner Herbert. Aye. Commissioner Robinson. Aye. Commissioner Thompson. Aye. Commissioner Williams. Aye. Resolution 1295, recognizing the 80th anniversary of TEA, is passed unanimously. And I'll remind the board, uh, next year is KB's 75th anniversary, so we'll be seeking your input and ideas for how we can do some sort of celebration. Yeah. <laughs> 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 All right. Let's see where we are now. President's report. Yeah. Um, as you know, we've had a couple of severe summer storms, and through those storms, we spent a lot of time and effort to try to improve our operations, but also to improve opportunities to communicate with our customers, not only about the status of the larger storm but about estimated restoration times for individual customers. I want to recognize Dawn Mosty. Uh, she has presented to you a couple of times on this, but we're getting ready to roll out the implementation of our new communication plan, and I thought you'd like to be aware of it. Good afternoon. Uh, last year we did provide a preview of some upcoming customer communication enhancements. And so today, what I'd like to do is give a brief overview of what are specifically those features. And the heart of the presentation today will be a demonstration using the iPad. We'll go to the enhanced outage map, as well as our uh, new mobile site, and kind of give you an idea of how that works. And we'll finish up with sort of the next steps from a communication perspective, as well as what's down the road as far as enhancements. Um, if I could take you back to June 2011, which was the largest outage, and it remains so, in KUB's history. At uh, the peak of the storm, as you all know, we had 127,000 customers without power of uh, or approximately 200,000 electric customers. And in our call center, in one day, we handled the number of calls we typically receive in a month. So it provided an excellent opportunity to get feedback from our customers in a short amount of time, and we learned a great deal. Uh, not only from our customers, you may remember in April 2011, the storms, the tornadoes in Alabama, uh, we talked to Alabama Power about their response, the types of information. So we've done a lot of benchmarking over the last uh, year, year and a half. And the proliferation of cell phones and technology has really changed our customers' expectations with regard to the tools that we use to communicate with them. They want specific, immediate information. They want us to talk to them either through text messaging or on the phone, which we currently do, emails based on their preferences. I think uh, it's been a couple of years ago, Commissioner Thompson said, held up her cell phone and said, I want something on, on this. So we're very excited that that's uh, rolling out <laughs> shortly. Um, as we talked about last year, our plan to conduct uh, focus groups with our customers did occur in September. And they did confirm the path we were on. But as we go through the remaining slides, and in particular the demonstration, I'll share with you some of their specific comments that really I think improve the overall product that we're going to roll out. So as I said, the customer input really drove the design. Uh, for the past uh, 12 to 18 months, we have been researching, designing, testing, and several of the items you see up there, we've already had what we call a soft launch. We've tested it internally with our employees. Uh, if I could, we'll take each of these items in turn and um, kind of give you an overview of those, but really, as I said, the biggest part, we'll, we'll get on the iPad and, and demo the enhanced outage map and the notification profile and the mobile site. So let's start off with the first item is the storm page. And the idea behind this is, as you all know, when we have significant outage events, KUB sends the message that normal operations have ceased. We're very much in storm mode. And we wanted our home page to reflect that sentiment as well. And some, um, a place where customers could go, get all the information they need, 
and when we had the major outages. And it's interesting, we did a mock-up for the focus groups of the storm page. And we had helpful safety hints and videos that they could see. And uh, we had kind of in the bottom right-hand corner the outage map. And the focus group participants said, all that's great, but I really want to see just the outage map. That's what I care about. And in fact, in January, you may remember we had the snowstorm, and 60% of all the hits that we got to our outage map were for smartphones. So it's really changing uh, the dynamic between us and our customers. So we have utilized the storm page twice in the January snowstorm. It replaced our home page, and as well as you may remember the, the pending ice storm, which fortunately didn't occur, we also utilized the storm page to uh, have information before the storm, things that you can do. Also, the focus group said, hey, make it easy to go back to the full site. You can see on the right hand um, along the top, you can just click and, and go. And you can report an outage directly from the screen. So again, sending the message, hey, you using storm mode at this time. And you can also see the enhanced outage map, which uh, was operational by December of last year. And it doesn't show the ERTs, I'll show you those in just a second, but you can see it does have a refresh and a countdown. It um, shows our service territory. You can sort it by different ways, counties, zip codes, communities. So again, providing more specific information to our customers based on the feedback we received. What did, what did the, uh, where it says before the storm, during the storm, after the storm, what, what information is that? Uh, the before the storm, when we used that, was basically, basically safety hints, make sure that your flashlights have batteries, uh, reminders about power lines in, in the event of a storm, and uh, information such as that. During the storm, very much safety focused again, updates on our crews, the number of crews we have available. And uh, after the storm, for example, sometimes we have customers with service lines that need to be repaired or the weather hit on their house, just things to think of uh, following the storm. And that really came from the focus group who, who said, well, yeah, we want to see the outage map, but help us plan uh, when you anticipate a major event. The most complex part of the whole project was estimated restoration times. Because as you all know, when we have a lot of customers without power, they want to know when it's going to be restored. And for the past 12 months, we have been in test mode where our overhead crews actually enter information into our outage management system that goes into our customer information system, which is then populating our website, our IBR, uh, I like to say we translate that to English for, by the time it gets to our customers and our, our customer service reps. But it does give more specific information about when your power will be restored. And basically we have two types of ERTs that uh, we use. And, and you all have heard these terms before, but the blue sky event. Those are the isolated outages, a limited number of customers are impacted, and based on our historical averages, which literally go back years, we know, for example, uh, if a car hits a pole, it's a single phase line, it should take around four hours to replace it. So we can provide, after 15 minutes, that estimated restoration time. And during our testing, the, the industry goal on this is around 80% completed within the, the initial ERT. And during our testing phase, we've been between 80 and 90% the entire time. So that, that's really good news on that. These are, again, system generated based on our experience on those similar type of events in the past. And obviously, these are updated continuously. If the crew gets on site, and says, well, it's not going to take as long, or perhaps this is a more complicated job. They update from the outage management system, and again, it flows through ultimately to our customers. And I'll show you in the demo how, how 
And contrasting that with the major storm events, such as this past January or June of 2011, these are where we have widespread outages, numerous customers, uh, usually multi-day events, and just due to the complexity of the situation, we can't immediately send out an ERT. We need to get our, our folks on site. We, we want to be as accurate as possible, but we can send out those messages at that time that indicate from a planning perspective whether this is, this could be a two-day event, a three-day event, because customers understand the feedback we got. We understand when you have 100,000 folks without power but we really, from a planning purpose, can we leave, should we leave? And that's what we'll, we'll do initially. And again, as those crews and damage assessors in the field, those will be updated accordingly. And now we'll, we'll run the demo. And this is a, um, the mobile site. It's actually in test mode, so it's going to be a little bit slower than in production, but uh, it will come back to that. But if we could, you can see down at the bottom of the screen, we can click full site. And it should pull that up. checking account set up and you can see it asked me is all this information correct it says no bank because it's a test but it has the name of the bank uh, and you see my project help donation I would just submit the payment and there's my confirmation so all of that online so if you already have that information online when, when you, if you were using the 
mobile and it said it'll it already have my same information. Right. There. So you have to right. register. <laughs> She's going to show you that. Yeah. Has uh, I've gone ahead and registered, logged in, just hopefully kind of now uh, to kind of show you. But you would have to to go ahead and register on the website to get this kind of information. Does it have checking and credit card information? Yeah, anything you okay. want to enter. Okay. And it's got a, a drop down where you can, I'd already entered a banking account with a routing number and account number. But anything you want to enter, you could you could do so. So from this, uh, let me show you another picture here. We want to look at the outage map. And uh, fortunately, this is a test, so that's not the outages. Uh, <laughs> and if you look uh, northeast, Granger County, there, the big purple dot, all I have to do is kind of my finger over that, and it will tell me some, some general information. Now, this isn't my outage specifically, so if it were, it would provide the estimated restoration time, but anybody, whether they're logged in or not, can pull up the outage map, basically access any of our dots by just moving your finger over and your mouse over, and you'll get that information. So if I wanted to check my status, It knows where I live, and it uh, can tell me, okay, outage reporting, my address, when it was reported, what the ERT is, 630, total customers impacted. And this is what is updated continuously as our crews get more information in the field, and I could go in there. If I had multiple accounts, it would <coughs> ask me which address that's for. So, just zeroes in right to my location. And you do have to be logged in to get specific information for your address and your outage. One of the reasons we did that was for security. <coughs> we don't want people to know that your house is without right. power, thus you're not there. So you have to log in to get your specific restoration time information. I can also, uh, if I want to report an outage, go back to the home screen. And it knows that where I live, I don't have wastewater. KUB doesn't run wastewater up there in East Knox County. So you can see that's grayed out. But everything else, whether it be a private security light, electric gas, whatever, I can click on that and basically report the outage. And again, it goes right into the, the system. Is that going to be the preferred method of reporting versus calling? Well, uh, I think. We have 70,000 registered web users. So when we talk about the communication plan in a minute, uh, that's the group we really want to be aware. We think that they will be the first to really jump on this. Uh, we realize there's always going to be a segment of our customer base that wants to talk to us, and that is not changing. We will, we will be there. But um, we do think this is a very kind of straightforward, easy way to report an outage, you get immediate feedback from uh, confirmation, so. And so when there is a storm, will, you know, the recording comes on, will it let people know? Because well, the reason I even said that is when a storm went, I was in my car on my cell phone, because my electricity's out and I didn't have a phone in the house. Yeah. So if, if when I called, I didn't have to wait, if I would have known to go to that website, I could have just gone right there on my phone, and then when people were calling me saying, hey, my electricity, I could just go to this website on your phone. Only if you have data for it. map just to kind of show you how it works in the full website. Very similar to our mobile site. Same features, you can uh, look at any outage, kind of see what's, who's impacted, check my status as well. You'll see the way I click that, of course, an outage. So it's very, very similar uh, information. Again, zooms in to your particular outage, your neighborhood, and provides that information. And if you call our IVR system,
system, you're going to see the exact same message. So all of that is um, seamless. And finally, let me. Uh, While this has been in test mode, the ladies, the men and women in the phone center have had this, and they've been able to predict restoration time based on that message. And it's been tested to see how reliable it is. So. Yeah, that's a, a good point. In January, since January, our customer service reps have had ERTs that they can provide the customer. And that's, feedback has been very good about that. And so this will enable the customer just, they don't want to call in, go right to the website, IVR, whatever, and they'll get the same information uh, about their specific outage. Um, finally here, um, I talked initially about customers want us to communicate with them based on the tools they want to use, whether that be email, smartphone, whatever. <coughs> so if you go to your account, and again, I'm logged in here, and you'll see over to the left, my notification profile. And when we launch this live for our customers, we will make this very easy to get to. It will be on the home page, you click, you go. Um, but for demo purposes, and again, it knows it's me. So it'll pull up the address, the account, the email they have on file for, for me. And you can see the bottom part is really the notification profile. This allows each customer to customize their interaction with us. And it defaults to the number on file. I can change that. I can receive information, text about my bill, about my outage information, vegetation management programs in the area, any construction programs. So if I wanted to edit this, you just click edit and say, well, you know, I really don't want to see the information about my, my bill through that text message on my phone. You click submit, and we know don't send a text to that phone about your bill, but say I want it on my email account. And you can add as many of these as you want. Add notification. You would just click email. It's going to default to the email that's on file, but I could change that if I wanted to. Click my bill, submit, and I would receive an email when my bill is ready. So that's how that works. Again, what types of information do you want to receive? What tools do you want to receive? And what devices do you want to receive those on? So, like I said, everything has sort of been in soft launch mode. We will be rolling out the website live, um, the uh, mobile site live in, in June. So um, our next steps are the communication plan. We'll put back to the PowerPoint. So beginning next month, we are obviously we want to increase customer awareness. Everything will be live. We'll have uh, bill stuffers, advertisements. But in talking to other utilities about how to launch this, they really suggested kind of continue that soft launch and target your communication to those customers who are already indicated they they feel comfortable with the technology. As I said, we have 70,000 customers who are already registered on the web, so we can send emails. There'll be a web message, a banner on our home screen, social media, a Facebook page, and other items, just kind of get the word out. And really, uh, what we've heard from other utilities is the ERTs, the, the best way to get that out is during a storm and you really will have a captive audience and, and that's when you can explain and get a lot of use from, from those. And this is always evolving, it's technology and customer expectations. Uh, we do have several things down the road after we, we go live with uh, the things I mentioned earlier in June. Real-time status updates. Basically, you saw the ERTs in the future when we update the ERT, if the customer selects that option, we can immediately send them a text. 
Uh, they don't have to go to our site. They want to know we can be proactive in getting that information. Location-based outage reporting, that's, uh, for example, that's using GPS. If you're at a street light and you see it's out, click, it knows you're there, send it on to us. Uh, last year we talked about the construction and vegetation management apps, and those are still underway for deployment this summer. The focus groups, and we showed them all the maps, we showed them the outage, vegetation management, construction. The feedback we got is focus on the outage map, not really as <coughs> interested in those other two. It's nice to have, we want to see it, but really our efforts have been on mobile site and the outage map. Uh, farther down the road, we have a complete review of our website, an assessment where we'll be, again, talking to our customers to get ideas about what they'd like to see on that. And I think the final bullet really sums it up. We're always researching. We don't want to jump on the latest bandwagon if it doesn't make sense for our customers. So it's really driven by their expectations and uh, always changing. And I, I would point out uh, this project was all internal with our customer relations, our communications, uh, IT operations. These folks have been on a team for well over a year now to kind of come up with these ideas. So no outside consultants, all KGB folks. Well, we have the ability to, to give advance warning. We anticipate a major storm Right, it's, uh, you know, we have the different levels of operation uh, with Syscon 3, which just may, basically means we're, we're getting upwards of five, 10,000 customers without power okay. is what triggers that. And that's why that delay on the, even the blue sky outages is, let's wait 15 minutes, just to see, okay, if there's something else going on besides a car hitting a single pole, is it a bigger situation? So that's kind of uh, it, it, kind of the process, and all of these steps are incorporated into our incident command structure. When we deploy the storm page, when uh, do we use the system generated ERTs, or is it getting to the point of a significant outage event? We need to suspend that and kind of wait for the crew assessment. Are there also going to be people um, like downstairs?
and completed the, the temporary pavement that needed to be done. This morning we moved the, the uh, barricade, the traffic control barricade, closure, and police officer on the east end from right here where he had been, closer to Kingston Pike, back to just west of Colony Way. Now that's only about a 600 foot movement, but it is significant in that it opens up the eastern end of Linesview Pike, particularly these two intersections here at Colony Way and Arrowhead Trail. So that's a commitment that we had made to the business owners that on that end, and we wanted to do that as quick as we could. So um, the work in Zone 2 has begun. Um, zone 2 is a little bit longer than Zone 1, uh, but you'll notice that there's no blue line right in here. Um, we'll only be doing sewer and gas work in Zone 2. The water line was updated, uh, part of it in 78 and part of it in 95, so it's relatively new and it's in good shape. Um, we anticipate that this, we're gonna continue to maintain good progress. Um, it extends from about 4734 on the eastern end to about the middle point of Cherokee Country Club. Um, now, we also have simultaneously begun this week the three directional bores that will place the pipes underneath the golf cart tunnel at the Country Club. That's one of the more challenging things on this project. Um, we are able to, to bore that, we think, since we did a test bore a couple of weeks ago and didn't hit any rock, so that's favorable. Uh, but we do have to do water, gas, and sewer bores underneath the tunnel. Um, we're in the process of issuing a media advisory. In fact, it may have gone out while we've been in here. We'll also be updating the progress map that's on the blog to the map that you see here. So, so far things have gone well. Uh, we're back on track to where we thought we would be. Uh, we started on April 15th, today's the 16th. Um, our time estimates were based on about one month per zone. So we're basically right where we thought we would be. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Will we remind drivers that even though they won't see that barricade when they're coming down Kingston Pike, that they, I guess we don't, we certainly don't want everybody to start thinking, well, it's open now, no go. Yes, let me, let me clarify that, that's a good question. Um, there will still be a barricade, what we call the Type 3 barricade down there that says road closed ahead. Uh, what we've moved is the hard closure with the officer in the barricade. So yes, they, they will still have the message board on Kingston Pike that tells them that it's closed. They'll still be able to see that barricade that's in the, the, over the island that tells them that it's closed ahead. <coughs> but we have moved it back 600 feet. And the officer is really the, the presence that, that enforces the closure the, through traffic. You know, the biggest complaint that I continue to have is the traffic on Kingston Pike. It's, it's ridiculous. It, it, it's really, really bad. And Friday afternoon, I was supposed to have a meeting, and a lady called me. She was in from Western Plaza to North Shore for 35 minutes. And I, it's really those two traffic lights that are down at North Shore and one down there by the two cities. They're not anything that we can get the city to help with. On, I mean, maybe just at those specific times we have no going to be a lot of traffic. Yes, sir. We get the afternoon rush hour is difficult. Uh, they've been monitoring it. Uh, we've been working with them for several months, even before the project started. They have adjusted the signal, the left turn signal there from Kingston Pike going south of North Shore. They have adjusted that so that more cars can turn and it doesn't back up into the lane. But frankly, it's just it's more cars than than that intersection can handle. I, I would also tell you that I talked to uh, Councilman Grieve on Tuesday, and he has been attempting to get uh, the city to have a plan to make improvements, temporary improvements through there. And he has um, so far not achieved what he hopes to achieve, but he did bring it up at City Council meeting this Tuesday night asking Chief Roush for police uh, assistance and the city engineering, traffic engineering staff to try to come up with some options. So he is very sensitive to it and is trying to use his influence on council to get something done. And, and you do have to be careful because even adjusting the, the, the length of the signal at Kingston Pike, it's, it backs it up when, from North Shore back to the where you get off the interstate. 
uh, that I've seen it backed up uh, from the light back in that direction a couple of times. So uh, helping one is going to back it up on the other side. I, I know some good uh, condos downtown. <laughs> <laughs> session, which is open to the public, and there's no other business than to adjourn.